live from Bloomberg's World Headquarters in Midtown Manhattan and streaming on Twitter. I'm Matt Miller. And I'm Kaylee Lines. Welcome to Bloomberg Crypto, a look at the people, transactions, and technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. Coming up, the world according to Sam Bankman freed the billionaire CEO of FTX on how to build a crypto fortune and then give it all away. And from one 30-year-old crypto titan to another, we're tracking the rise of Bitcoin's most watched whale. Plus, we're going to speak with Jamie Leverton, the CEO of Canadian Bitcoin miner Hut8. She'll talk strategy as costs rise and prices swing. All of that is ahead, but first, let's get a snapshot of the market and away, oh, the way some individual tokens are moving in today's trade. No surprise, given the broader risk on sentiment, you're seeing a lot of them, most of them in the green, including Bitcoin up about 1.7 percent. We're north of 41,000 yet again, although we still remain in the range we've been in really for the duration of 2022 thus far. We are seeing some outperformance when it comes to Ether up about 3 percent. We're trading in and around 3,100, Ripple up about 2 percent as well. I wanted to point to Monero, though, Matt, because this was a really interesting story of yesterday. Day. While most other coins were down, this altcoin in particular, which focuses on privacy, was actually up about 6.5%. A coordinated move for some holders of this token to withdraw from exchanges is basically a coordinated attempt at a short squeeze. That drove it up pretty far yesterday, but it's actually underperforming today. Only up about 8 tenths of 1% trading right around 255. All right, very important uh, to watch those coordinations and correlations. This chart that I have is really interesting because about 10 years ago, I asked an assistant treasury secretary if he thought uh, Bitcoin was a commodity or a currency. He said commodity. I'm looking at correlations between cryptocurrencies and the commodities index, and we can see that it's actually at the lowest level that it has been in recent years. So right now, Bitcoin is really trading at a high correlation more with tech stocks and the NASDAQ 100. The crypto community remains undeterred, keeping its faith in the resilience in the space. The ecosystem that's being built around crypto. The incredible growth in this whole sector. Nothing short of amazing. So much momentum going uh, happening right now. Adoption is huge. Investment capital and growth capital. A focus on real use cases, on real adoption. Continue to drive the uh, in incredible growth and adoption. The evolution of the protocols. Tremendous progress in the regulatory environment. It's a great moment for Bitcoin. The, the crypto economy is quite resilient. From Bitcoin bulls to Bitcoin's most watched whale, today's Big Take story takes a closer look at one of the most influential and the most controversial figures in crypto. Shanali Basak has the story. There Shanali? billions of dollars at play here, Matt. We're going to talk about Do Kwan, who went from being a little-known startup founder of Terraform Labs, which powers the Terra blockchain, to one of the biggest whales in Bitcoin. This year, a group that was led by Kwan bought over $1.5 billion in Bitcoin, and there's a pledge to purchase as much as $10 billion worth of the token to help prop up the Terra blockchain and its stable coin. Now, Kwan's big moves have really polarized the world of crypto. And on one side, you've got legions of fans and deep-pocketed crypto backers like Coinbase Base Ventures, Galaxy Digital of Mike Novogratz, and Pantera Capital. And these so-called lunatics, a nod to the Luna token. Remember, Mike Novogratz himself has that Luna tattoo. They're working towards the ultimate goal of creating a digital cash that can bypass banks, payment processors, and all of their fees and regulations. But let's look at the other side, because there are critics who say that Do Kwan is doomed to fail, and some launch accusations of a Ponzi scheme. Others are warning, and without much evidence as of this point, that the risks can bring down the entire world of digital assets. Uh, that it could bring down the whole world. That's a big deal, right? Because this is not just saying um, that the risks could bring down Terra um, or Luna, but it could bring down all digital assets. And that's the, the, the worry, I think, in general around stable coins. Right, that it's more of a systemic risk than anything else. But I think it speaks really to the polarization in, in this market as a whole, where you have some people so for it, so bullish, and on the complete other end of the spectrum, some people who don't believe it, believe in it at all. What I love about this story is just the color that it shows as well. In addition to the tattoos like Mike Novogratz had, mm -hmm. Juan has a newborn daughter. She's named Luna. How yeah, apt. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> interesting the lengths to which these people yeah. go to it's show passion. their dedication. And Shanali, I also think it's interesting that um, 
you know, this is about a, a, an interesting and delicate dance because on the one hand, you're trying to create a cryptocurrency that is not beholden to any government, that doesn't allow for any kind of censorship. Um, on the other hand, those who are pushing for regulation probably don't want to stick their necks out that far when we're in the middle of um, uh, the Russian war in Ukraine. In any case, we'll talk more about that a little bit later. I'll ask Sam Bankman-Fried what he thinks about the lunatics. He joins us um, later on in the program as well as the CEO of HUT8, Jamie Leverton. Plus, Jan Van Eck weighs in on whether he thinks ETFs are the way to play the new era of investing. And to access all of the latest data and news on crypto in general, check out CRYP Go on the terminal. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Crypto. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lines. Joining us now is Sam Bankman-Fried, founder and CEO of FTX. Sam was profiled in a recent big take on how he plans to give away his fortune. Um, and it was a fascinating story. Sam, I have to first ask, are you playing a video game right now? <laughs> Not going to comment on that one. You, you can take a guess. <laughs> All right. Well, that's that's cool. I'm actually configuring a truck as we speak. But I, I wanted <laughs> to hear uh, your views on this Luna debate because I think it's so fascinating um, that there's a community that wants to bring crypto almost back to its roots. Right? You want to have an uncensored, untouchable by government um, coin currency so that. You know, one person can't just turn off another person's money for whatever arbitrary reason. Are you in the, the camp that's for it or against it? So, I mean, I think that there are a lot of interesting things going on there. I think, you know, one of them, I, uh, you know, always to keep in mind when you think about governmental control, right, is there's a lot of governments in the world. This question looks different depending on where you're approaching it from. And, you know, certainly everyone has, has their own, you know, thoughts about about which, you know, which, which government is sort of which there. Um, I think one of, you know, you, you can look at sort of like, you know, UST, the like stable coin on, on, on Luna, which I, I think is a cool idea. It's, you know, fundamentally when you ultimately look at the controls in place, um, you still have controls on the cashing in and the cashing out um, in the same way that you do, you know, with any other cryptocurrency. And, you know, frankly, you also still have, um, you know, with UST, interestingly, um, I, uh, you know, you, you still have all of the exchange AML KYC control. So in many ways, I actually think from an, a, you know, ultimately from an AML KYC perspective, that there, there, there are a lot of similarities between it and, um, you know, and, and other cryptocurrencies. I think one of the the interesting parts when you look at an algorithmic stablecoin, which is what UST is, right. is you know the is is you know the question of the stability of the backings. Um, and the decentralization of them. And I, I think that has lots of imp you know, interesting, important implications for market uh, you know, stability. We actually have a viewer um, who writes in, Sam, with a question asking if you think the market hasn't fully priced in the possibility of a stable coin like Tether failing. It's an interesting question. And I think that the, um, it, it all comes down to the details here. I think like worrying about a stable coin failing is a really important thing for the market to do because it's really bad if a stable coin fails. It undermines a lot of trust in the system. As it turns out right now, I think that the major USD backed stable coins, including Tether, are very unlikely to fail. I think that as it turns out right now, um, you know, I we've seen them go through pretty, you know, extreme periods. Um, they are all generally backed. Um, I, I, I don't want to make claims that they're backed perfectly or perfectly transparent around it, but I think they're much more backed than they are unbacked. Um, and so from some perspectives, I think things are in an okay state. Um, but, I, you know, that need not be true going forward necessarily. Like this is going to be an ongoing concern. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons that it would make a lot of sense to have mandated audits of stable coins. Yeah, and we know that stablecoins have gotten a lot of attention from regulators. And on the subject of regulation, Sam, you have been pushing for the CFTC to have a greater role, a greater hand in that. Can you just shed some light for us on what exactly the proposals you are discussing with the CFTC are, what you're hoping to accomplish, and whether that will go beyond crypto into other asset classes like equities, commodities trading? 
So for now, just talking about, about crypto on, on, on that perspective, I think there are really interesting questions on other topics. I think that we're, we're you know, not particularly close to being uh, ready to address some of those. Um, but I, I think that like on the crypto side, what are the core pieces of it? Um, you know, the CFTC is already the regulator for Bitcoin futures, for Ethereum futures, for, you know, digital asset commodity futures contracts, the same way it is, you know, for other commodity uh, futures contracts. Um, one piece of what we've been looking at has been uh, basically, you know, uh, the sort of uh, market structure that you see with cryptocurrency exchanges today has some differences from what you see with traditional uh, commodities venues. And, and, and the biggest ones there, um, first of all, uh, is that the collateral for a futures position on you know, FTX International today is held with FTX. So if you want to put on a Bitcoin futures position, the first thing you have to do is deposit funds to FTX's collateral. The clearinghouse holds all that collateral and has real-time 24-7 monitoring of it and deleveraging if positions start going under. Um, the traditional setup for um, other uh, you know, commodities platforms in general is instead that um, there's a series of intermediaries that hold that collateral and I, or at least that have agreements around that collateral. It's not always clear if they necessarily hold all of that collateral. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not transparent to most people what's going on there. And you saw this playing out with the uh, you know, LME nickel contracts where right. you know, by the time they'd had time to dive into what had happened, in fact, someone was like $8 billion underwater and everyone else you know, looks like they might get stuck bailing them out. All right, well, Sam, obviously whatever regulation is put into place won't just affect FTX. How could your plans change the way that more traditional Wall Street firms operate and trade? So, I mean, one of the big things is I think it, it, that, it, that it may provide a pathway for them to get involved in digital assets. Um, that, that's frankly something I, I'm excited about here. Um, you know, I think a lot of them have been waiting for, uh, you know, clear federal oversight of the space to get involved. Um, I think that there are really interesting applications to other asset classes. Now, you have to be careful when you do that because you have to look at what do existing settlement cycles look like in you know, traditional agricultural commodities. How would that interface with a system like this? I think it's an interesting question. I think it's one that you know, needs more thought. And certainly, you know, we would be looking to start just with doing this for digital assets. Um, but, but I do think that, that you know, it would be really interesting to do a deep dive um, you know, with the CFTC and crucially with the, the core market participants in those areas about how this could you know, interface with that. I think when you look at things like treasuries, right, I think tokenized treasuries could be really interesting. I think you could provide transparency and real time mm. settlement of them. Getting rid of this sort of like T0, T1, T2 system that we have for various asset classes, right, with securities where it takes two days to settle a trade and there's sort of like some amount of uncertainty and, and risk and, and exposure during those two days. I think it would be really cool to see you know, real-time margining, real-time risk, and real-time settlement, you know, based on tokens of those. So I think there are really interesting applications to a pretty wide variety of assets. Although a fat finger would be a big problem in that case, right, Sam? I mean, so many people have learned the hard way. What's the cash transfer service? Zelle has mm -hmm. been really useful for yeah. scammers and stealing money from people that can never get it back. Yeah, it's interesting, but you know the truth is that there is exposures in both cases. And if you ask, like, what type of fraud does FTX see users attempting to perpetrate the most? Like, what is the most frequent, uh, uh, you know, a, a fraudulent attempt on FTX? It's not using cryptocurrencies. By far, the most common is using credit cards and ACH transfers. And the reason is just typical chargeback. Um, it takes months for those to fully settle. And so you see people coming in, buying assets with them, and then attempting to cancel the payment after having already bought something with it and, and certainly not returning the other side of it, right? This is a huge problem that lots of businesses face, and, and it's a, a nightmare to try and resolve. And, um, and, and it's a consequence of the, the largely delayed settlement mm. that, that we as a platform have to choose between, you know, do we wait a month to credit people their funds? Like, that would be ridiculous. Um, but of course, because we don't do that, we have to uh, try and figure out who is a fraudulent user and who is not, which is not an easy question either. 
Okay, Sam, I want to pivot to another story we've been carefully following at uh, Bloomberg for the last couple of weeks, and I know you've been following it too. Elon Musk's bid for Twitter. We just had a headline crossing from the New York Post that he's willing to invest 10 to $15 billion of his own cash for Twitter. Whether or not he eventually succeeds, you have proposed a decentralized model for Twitter. Can you just walk us through that and how you think it will be beneficial to the company? Absolutely. I think this would be a really, really interesting and important innovation in, in uh, you know, social networks. Obviously, we'd have to see how it actually played out. But here's the core of it. Um, right now, one of the big problems with social media is there's lots of platforms and all the platforms are completely independent of each other. There's no ability to see a tweet on Facebook. If you message someone on Facebook, you even WhatsApp can't read it. And that that's even the same company. Um, and so it's this, you know, really messy system where there are, uh, you know, there's no interoperability between different platforms. Um, and there's a, a second problem that you have here is around uh, basically moderation, right? Like, what is the moderation policy for basically all of social media right now? It's like three guys, right? It, it's the people who run three companies who choose what does and doesn't get censored. Um, and, and we've seen that that is a broken model, right? We saw uh, social media choose not to censor. Um, misinformation in 2016 and get absolutely roasted for that decision. And then we saw them choose to censor in 2020 and get roasted for that decision. Um, and uh, and so here's the core of what I think would be really, uh, really exciting, um, would be that you take um, a blockchain, you put the actual underlying messages directly on the blockchain. Um, and what that means is that any platform in theory could access those same sets of messages um, and so whether you're using, you know, Facebook, Twitter, or, or whatever this sort of like, you know, platform is, they, they're all drawing on all of the messages. They can all write to this blockchain. They can all read from it. What they are is different interfaces, effectively, mm. living in this same universe. And one of the cool things that falls out of that is, first of all, you have interoperability between platforms, which solves a lot of these network problems and allows for more competition because it means new people can enter this space without being miles behind in terms of, uh, you know, user base growth. Um, but the other thing that it means um, is that when it comes to moderation, you could have different platforms making different decisions, right? And so you could have, you know, two people have two different platforms, but each with the same underlying set of messages accessible. And so, um, you know, they, they don't um, have to deal with this, this network effect problem, but, but which makes slightly different decisions about what to censor, what not to censor. Um, and I, you know, and, and that can at least give some consumer choice here. It can at Sam, least give people, you know, options. Sam, I think it's a fascinating idea. And I also uh, had seen CZ tweet about it um, on the Elon Musk Twitter announcement day. I'm just wondering, have you talked to Elon about this? No, oh, I have not talked directly to, to Elon about this, um, but I, I would be excited to. Um, I, you know, have had some conversations with, uh, you know, people who are investigating this. I think they're they're really cool ideas, um, and I would be really excited to be, you know, potentially involved in, in, in something here. Whether you're looking at, um, you know, thinking, I, I think the the biggest thing would be thinking about how blockchain could be applied here. Um, you know, maybe as a test case first, I'd be excited to help on on the designing and building of it, um, and. I, uh, you know, on I, uh, you know, potentially helping to manage a, a network that that was looking to do this. All right. Well, maybe we can facilitate that conversation. Um, I want to facilitate another one right now and bring Jamie Leverton into the conversation. She is the CEO of Hut Eight Mining. Uh, Jamie, I was going to ask Sam, and I also want to ask you. There's so much talk about the possibility of a crypto winter, a multi-year crypto winter. Are you worried about that? I, I think the possibility is remote just based on the continued acceleration we're seeing of adoption, skeptics now become, becoming proponents, the backdrop of the inflationary environment. I, I, I personally don't see it. That said, uh, I run a publicly traded Bitcoin mining company, and so we need to prepare for all cycles. And, and one of the things that we've done to do that is uh, to build a, a more diversified strategy. Well, to your point on being publicly traded, the miners in particular, HUT8 being one of them, have had a pretty rough go of it so far <laughs> this year. There's a lot of concern out there about margin pressures in particular because you need energy in order to mine, and yet energy costs have been surging. How worried are you about your margins and, and surging costs in order to do what you do? 
Yeah, I mean, we're one of the lucky ones in that we've been around. Uh, this is our third cycle, so we were born in a bull market. We survived a bear market. Uh, we've been, we were thriving in this uh, most recent market. We'll decide what it ends up being. Um, and so for us, we've got, we've got already have scaled operations. We work well with our local communities. We're building a third site that actually gives us a fixed rate of power, so it reduces our exposure there. Uh, one thing people don't often know about mining equipment is you can um, dial up how much power it uses and the, and the output. So, so there, there is some protection built in. Uh, from the hardware directly, but we're still margins. Um, I'm not sure if you saw our, our last quarterly financials. Margins continue to be very strong, um, and we don't see pressure for a fully scaled business uh, coming in the short term. Although for the smaller miners in the space that may have uh, paid peak market prices for the hardware last year, that might not have the, the kind of built out scale, they could definitely uh, be under pressure sooner rather than later if this continues. Really interesting. And Sam, I want to bring you back back in as well if you've been listening to Matt's point on the crypto winter a lot of the action we have seen in high risk assets cryptocurrencies being among them has been driven in part by abundant liquidity that is now an environment that's changing fiscal stimulus is no longer uh, what it once was a few years ago and I'm wondering how you are expecting that to influence volumes on FTX in particular so I mean look it's going to happen right like it's clearly going to impact the business um, and, you know, you've already seen uh, a, a market, I mean, we've, you know, generally been growing in market share, but you've seen a market wide decline um, in volumes to some extent, you know, driven in, in large part by monetary policy um, and, and by, you know, expectations of, of future inflation effectively. Um, that all being said, um, I, I think something that, that's important to keep in mind here, um, you know, is, is that, this is this is a pretty different situation than what we were looking at in 2018, 2019, right? If in 2018 you had a, a massive shock to the system, I, I, that that would have been way worse because it was a way less developed ecosystem. There's way less capital backing it. There's way less institutional buy-in, and, and that just like increased the risk from a lot of perspectives. And so I think that you know it is in a, a much more stable general position today than it was in you know a few years ago, which is going to help backstop it. The, the other thing I'll say on the monetary policy side, I do think it's very important, but it's also worth remembering that, you know, in theory, in an efficient market, um, you see the impact of that all front loaded, right? It's not like every time that there is a rate hike, you expect to see a massive market change because of that. Um, in theory, markets should already have anticipated, you know, future rate hikes and, um, you know, market conditions should already reflect what that is. And it should just be surprising announcements mm. um, that cause you know, price moves, for instance. I don't want to say we're in a perfectly efficient market, but I think that over the last um, you know few months, we've already realized a, a lot of what people's best guess is about the you know medium-term impact of monetary policy. Uh, Jamie, I want to ask you about your mining policies, and I, um, keeping in mind that Sam is very philanthropic and he's um, directing at some point all of his profits to the betterment of society. Um, you have made a shift, made a pivot to a more sustainable um, form of mining in terms of your energy use as well. But of course, most of the tokens that you're putting out, I think everything maybe is fungible, right? So there's no way for Sam to control or for a buyer to decide which um, Bitcoin miner he wants to get or she wants to get her supply from. What do you do about that? Yeah, that's that question comes up a lot. Um, so you can buy a miner's equity specifically if you if you want to get direct access to a, a miner or a miner's output. Um, but you don't get to choose where your what mint your twenty dollar bill comes from, and it's really the same concept here. Interesting. We actually just had a viewer writing in about what happens to everything that you're investing in these mining machines when eventually the last Bitcoin is mined, is the question from the viewer. In we're the talking limited <laughs> quantities. In the year 2140, we will all be dead. Um, <laughs> but the, the, the real, well, like a red I don't know. Question from 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the miners don't just mint new coins to use that phrase, they also yeah. are responsible for processing all of the transactions on the network. And so a component of a miner's revenue comes from transaction fees. Yeah. So in the year 2140.01, <laughs> uh, a miner's revenue will be entirely from the transaction fees uh, responsible for 
processing everything that happens on the network and keeping yeah. the network secure. I think people um, maybe don't understand that miners are responsible for the security of the entire right. Bitcoin blockchain, and we play an absolutely crucial role in yeah. keeping the ecosystem healthy. I think a lot of people think are a lot of people are cynical and think that somehow miners are going to create a fork that allows them to keep providing more supply. But <laughs> yeah. that's a conversation for another time. Sam Bankman-Fried, thank you so much for joining us. Jamie Leverton of HUD8 Mining.